Welcome to Every Church a Peace Church, a program that promotes the belief that the church could turn the world towards peace if the church lived and taught as Jesus lived and taught. Welcome again. My name is Don Edwards. I'm your host for Every Church a Peace Church, a program that airs three times every week on the AIB uh, channel. And we hope that you continue to watch and look forward to our program. We have an exciting uh, program, a very full program today. We have a wonderful peacemaking team, uh, Gerald Levin and his wife, Dr. Sis Levin. Uh, they are uh, active in the role of peacemaking. They uh, have spent uh, 20, past 20 years uh, involved in peacemaking in the West Bank primarily. They've just returned from Baghdad in Iraq. We're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about Palestine and the West Bank. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, how uh, Jerry, uh, who was a former uh, CNN uh, Middle East bureau chief, was kidnapped in 1984 by Hezbollah and spent uh, 11 months in captivity uh, and was freed through the efforts of his wife, Sis, now, um, that story has been uh, recounted in an ABC TV movie called Held Hostage. And there's also a book that, uh, that Jerry and, and Sis have published that describes that captivity and his conversion from a Jewish American atheist to a follower of Jesus. So uh, we have a lot to talk about, and to try to do this all in a half hour is going to be a wonderful blessing. Uh, but stay tuned, and uh, uh, let's get right, without any further hesitation, um, I'd like to introduce our audience to Jerry and Dr. Sis Levin. Thank you so much for being with us on Every Church of Peace Church. Thank you. Um, Jerry, we, how do we get from being a uh, grandson of a rabbi to uh, an atheist to now a Christian peacemaker, one who is searching, following the path of the nonviolent Jesus in the West Bank, uh, in Birmingham, Alabama, where, you, where you're home, and uh, how, how do we get to that transformation, that conversion? How did that happen? It's a long story, but I'll try to make it very, very, very short. It happened within a month of my being kidnapped by Hezbollah. And when I began to think about the conditions of my captivity, what caused it, suddenly I was struck by, to me, a very alien notion. And that was that it was violence to a great extent that put me in this particular position. And not just the violence, the so-called bad guys, the people who had kidnapped me, but also the violence of the so-called good guys, that is the United States, who had become involved in the Civil War in, in Lebanon and really, as history has proved, didn't have a clue as to what it was all about. Nevertheless, they were there. And therefore, both the violent inclinations on both sides resulted in me being taken uh, captive. That, that, began to, uh, that led me to begin to think about the whole issue of violence. Up till that time, I thought violence in certain instances had its uses, was efficacious at certain times, including warfare. Mm. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized what I now call the futility of violence. And again, not just the violence of the so-called bad guys, so-called good guys too. And that, then that led me to thinking about a man with which with whom I had no identification in the past, and that was Jesus, and began to think about what he taught and what was, what was relayed to us through the Gospels and what he taught especially in the Sermon on the Mount and especially about nonviolence. And when I began to put the two and two together, I realized it wasn't Jesus and his teachings that were wrong and that were inimical to peace, but they were actually the opposite. And all those that thought there were uses to which violence could be used with respect to peacemaking were really beyond, beyond the pale. And so that led me to think about him, to think about him in relation to his divinity, relig uh, began to think about him in relation to the whole idea of religion and especially faith in God. 
You, and very quickly, I made a turnaround. You were uh, held uh, cap you kidnapped and held captive for how long? Eleven and a half months. And that was uh, all. Well, you, you held captive in Beirut. No, well, uh, in the eastern uh, Baca, which is eastern Lebanon, in and around a, right. an ancient town called Baalbek. And your wife, uh, Doctor Sis Levin. Well, it wasn't doctor then. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I, was, I was in the Near East School of Theology in Beirut. I was going to be uh, an Episcopal priest when I grew up. Mm -hmm. And uh, it came down on my part to simply believing the gospel. The truth will set you free. The only brave thing that I think I've ever done in my life, although I'm rethinking it a little after Baghdad, <laughs> but <laughs> nevertheless, um, after about nine months of the United States government telling me to be quiet and stay in my room and read my Bible, uh, and then mentioning in broadcast, if they ever did, that the hostages, because after about nine months there were a handful of them, that they were held in a mysterious fashion. The, the, the government would say, the president would say, and the State Department. President Reagan. President Reagan and his State Department, and they didn't get along in those days either. Uh, we don't know who they are or what they want or even what this is about. And I give you a direct quote. He would say, it is mindless, groundless, insane terrorism. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't true. Uh, they had videotapes, as they always do when they take uh, hostages. Yes. They do a videotape with the, the hostage holding up a newspaper with the date on it, so you know that day at least. So they had the video of, of your husband? So they videotaped all of the hostages, okay. and you knew the date, so you knew they were alive. At least you had that. And then they explained what they wanted. They wanted to do an exchange. In their minds, uh, the hostages were prisoners of war, and in their minds, we were at war although we never declared war on Lebanon, as we did in Baghdad, never even threatened. Uh, nevertheless, the battleship New Jersey was firing into Lebanon. Civilians were being killed. Israel had invaded Lebanon. And the Christian army, Christian army, had slaughtered... Real, real big quotes. Real big ones. Had, uh, had slaughtered the Palestinian refugees in the camps with the Israelis, Sharon at their head, turning on the lights when it grew dark so they could see to do their bloody work. And my, my understanding of that was everybody was wrong. Mm -hmm. Everybody was wrong. And I kept thinking of the truth. The truth will set you free. So how did, how did you exercise that truth I went set public. Your husband free? I went public. And I went on American television, which was in those days fairly easy to do, especially with my husband, a bureau chief for CNN. And I looked into the camera and told the truth, no matter what the question was mm -hmm. or what the format was. Mm -hmm. And they would slip to commercial lots of times. Mm -hmm. I would say, you don't understand. You don't understand this problem. We are writing off a whole part of the world. Mm -hmm. To me, it is the family of Abraham. Yes. We're in this together, the Christians, the Muslims, and the Jews. We must learn to be a family, to love each other, to even, as, as Jesus said, love your enemy, yeah. or else. Right. This mad, insane killing has got to stop. So that was my small role in it, but it was heard all over the world, mm -hmm. even by the captors. Mm -hmm. And it seems to have made a great deal of difference as a, as a broadcast intervention. And, and Read the book. Yeah. <laughs> yes, the, the, the book is called? The book is called Beirut Diary because Jerry said, keep a diary. And you might have something to tell your grandchildren. And, of course, I did. We had no idea it would turn so dramatic. And InterVarsity Christian Publishers published the book. Well, I'm glad that uh, we're all blessed that the outcome for, for Jerry uh, in Lebanon was, uh, was one of life where so much death uh, 
both to the Marines there and, and to all the other s people. Well, so. I'm glad, too, for very selfish reasons. <laughs> if it hadn't happened, I never would have met, about 17 years later, John Stoner, Every Church of Peace Church, and been led to Christian peacemaker teams. Yeah. Because John Stoner, in those past two years, has been an incredible mentor and influence in our lives. Right. And the Every Church of Peace Church program is absolutely vital. Yes. Well, we're going to talk more about uh, Every Church of Peace Church uh, and John Stoner will be one of our guests in the upcoming show, so a okay. program, so good. make good. sure you get a chance to, to uh, look at that. Uh, right now, uh, we're going to take a little break uh, for a couple of minutes while we listen to the beautiful sounds of Kathleen Jackson Bertrand, who gives us a message about peace in her very, very special way, along with her accompanist, Phil Davis. Welcome back, and thank you so much, Kathleen Bert Jackson Bertrand and her accompanist, Phil Davis. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. Do you agree? Amen. Absolutely. And uh, <laughs> God blesses Make you. Make love, not war. <laughs> yes, we, God blesses you for really the commitment, the, the really ground-working, grass-root commitment, active commitment that you are both doing. Uh, you, you're in very dangerous places and Christians must walk in dangerous places if they are going to be the light that, that Jesus has asked us to be the light for peace, the light for reconciliation, for compassion, compassion and forgiveness. Uh, the problem with that is we've got many so-called Christians who feel that walking in dangerous places can be done with a gun. <laughs> that somehow peacemaking can be done with a gun. Yes. And that's a real tragedy for the world and for Christianity. Yes, yes. It's, it's a tragedy for any faith exactly. that feels that they can promote their faith th through violence. That's right. Uh, I don't know how many guests that have preceded you on this program that has said that violence begets violence mm -hmm. and of course uh, our model Jesus said that uh, those who live by the sword will perish by the sword mm -hmm. and in that just in that saying uh, reflects really the 
the uh, the value of violence, which is which is to get more violence. And isn't it tragic how that particular teaching has been twisted around by many Christians to mean that, well, Jesus said those who live by the sword shall die by the sword, which will then condone capital punishment and warfare as as well to punish yeah. those with with a sword because they had a sword, mm -hmm. which is not what he meant at all. Yeah, well, we all we all know how. Uh, we have perverted uh, the, or ignored the, uh, the, if not the words of Jesus, then certainly the, the, the mission that he, that he had. I, I think it has to be perverted because uh, in any language, uh, there's, there's no wiggle room. You know, he spoke Aramaic, but in, in Aramaic or in any language, love your enemies cannot mean kill them under any circumstances. It yeah. just won't compute. Yeah. So I, I think it, it, it simply has to be faced and we have to, we have to challenge each other yes. if we're going to use yes. the name Christian. Yes. Uh, well, particularly, particularly in these times when, when there's so much <laughs> force to, uh, to, to motivate us uh, to, to hate our enemies and to, to strike Strike at our enemies. Uh, that that that's the that's the message being put out by the media, the politics, uh, and it's not a, a a a new message, but it's a long-lasting one that that really requires a long-lasting uh, resistance. But you know, you you can't kill anybody you don't hate, so it's a very clever message. Yeah. Yes. You have to be persuaded to hate, yeah. and you don't know really once you start down that road mm -hmm. what's happening to yeah. you and that's and why that's the evil part of it. and that's why politically speaking there hasn't been a dime's worth of difference between any of the administrations in my lifetime mm -hmm. whether or not wars were supposed to were justified or not every administration at one time or another in my uh, in my lifetime has used hatred as a tool mm -hmm. for going to war yes 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 and, that, and that's 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 plain for those who wish to see. Absolutely, it's a it's a form of spiritual demagoguery because in every instance they said that God condones this. Yes, let's talk a little bit about your experiences in the West Bank. Uh, that's where your your work, both in the Christian peacemaker teams, and yours, uh, Doctor Levin, with the children uh, in in the in the West Bank. Tell us a little bit about what your work is with the children. Well, um, I was, as I mentioned, in seminary, and after Jerry's coming to freedom, to real freedom, mm -hmm. <laughs> what that means is the freedom to understand uh, about nonviolence, mm -hmm. because a violent victory is no victory at all. Uh, I felt very compelled to learn how to teach children because I believe the children are our real hope, maybe our only hope. Uh, and so I went back to school and did a master's and a doctorate in the pedagogical side of it. How do you teach this? Because teachers are not trained to teach this way. What's your thesis? Uh, uh... Well, my, my doctoral thesis, which after some argument they allowed at Columbia, was uh, the role of forgiveness in conflict resolution. Because we're very much aware of this thing called conflict resolution, and an enormous number of us are aware of the fact that violence is our number one health problem yeah. in the world. More children are killed and killing each other by violence. Describe, by describe your program for me, so for, for, the, for our audience. The, answer to it, of course, is nonviolence, but how do you get there? You have to learn. Jesus was very clear about this, incidentally, but you have to learn, and to learn you have to be trained, and somebody has to be trained to teach it. It has to be systemic. In other words, we start in kindergarten and progressively, as the child cognitively is able to understand the steps in how to live nonviolently, which comprehensively include a lot of things, the child begins to realize it works. <laughs> it not only works, but there's joy in it. And increasingly, increasingly the medical world has come around to our side 
because doctors' offices, particularly therapists' offices, are full of depressed children mm -hmm. or children who've killed each other or hurt yeah. each other. And so they say, we can tell you the problem, but we can't tell you what to do about it. How to prevent it, what to do about it, is going to happen in schools. Now, I'm taking a, a minute longer to say the popular answer is, no, it has to be done at home. Let me tell you what's wrong with that. To have systemic change, and we're talking about a system change, you have to do it in a system. You could have a classroom with 29 perfect children and one really messed up one for whatever reason. Only one child with a gun can wipe a school out. So you see what I mean? Even if you had almost all perfect families, it just takes one messed up. We have to go for the whole system. And thank God it works. There has to be a place where systemically they have a different vision, a safe haven where they have a different vision of what the world can be like, how it really works, and the joy of it. So how do you do? How do you apply that theory to your practice? The practice there. I in the train West Bank? the teachers, okay. and I help them put their hands on the material. Uh, the the most recent and exciting one that's working well is te teaching English, teaching English either as a second or third language, or absolutely teaching it in class to get our English up to speed, which we all want, mm -hmm. by using the content of peacemaking in it. Instead of see the dog run, we talk about, I am a peace builder. I want to build peace. How do I do that? Mm -hmm. I learn to share. I learn not to disrespect each other. Mm -hmm. I, I learn to listen actively. Mm -hmm. I learn the principle as I get there of shared needs mm -hmm. because you have needs and I have needs and we can share them creative, imaginative things come forth when you behave like this instead of competing so rigorously against each other. Mm -hmm. I gotta win and for me to win you gotta lose yeah. and that's the way it works. Yeah. It really doesn't work that, well, that way. That's the, your, 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 um, your theories you've put in practice not only in Birmingham, Alabama but you've put them in practice in the West Bank and teaching uh, both Islamic, Jewish, Druze, uh, Christian the children that, that they all have to uh, learn to understand and respect each other as, as, as images of God. The, well, the they know this instinctively, and they know that it's at the heart of the book. You know, we're called the people of the book, mm -hmm. the Koran and the Torah and the, and the New Testament, the Gospel. We know it's there. We know the God who loves us as his children wants us to live this way. The point is, does it work? And so I think sometimes we, we doubt his word. Yes, it does work. The designer designed us to live this way. Yes. But we haven't studied it. We haven't practiced it. No. We haven't trained to do it. Right. And then we've let people tell us, for our own security, we better wipe out yeah. some other people. Yeah. And in wiping them out, first we've got to hate them. They're all terrorists, you know. Right. Um, let's talk a little bit about your Baghdad experience. You were there during shock and awe. You were there during the invasion by the coalition of forces. Um, and afterwards. And afterwards. Uh, tell us your impressions of, of Iraq during, during this time. If in in twenty words or less. <laughs> well, in twenty words or less, I can say that. Hell, uh, first of all, we, hell. We, we both were there, but but uh, Iraq is a bleeding carcass. Iraq is a bleeding carcass, lying helpless, helpless, because not o not only because of its past, which caught up with with some of its leaders, but also because of an occupation that's gone bad.
and that is not in a self-correcting mode as yet. And our greatest fear is that it will not correct itself in time. By that I mean in time before some kind of civil strife work, uh, breaks out and also a massive retaliation by completely frustrated people who were led to believe they would expect much more from the occupation in it, with respect to liberation, which is turning out to be much more of a conquest than anything else that turns on our soldiers. You've talked with some of the soldiers, how, how, how the American soldiers. How are they, what, what are some of the things that they're telling you about, about their role uh, as occupiers in Iraq? Well, they run the gamut from to a great extent feeling the same way we do to also the other end which is which is pure hatred uh... so we we get all of it but generally speaking i think that the dog face if you will the enlisted gi especially some of them and per, perhaps a rising number but i'm not sure are beginning to realize that they were in that they've been kind of pawns in a conflict that they've been led to understand was one thing, but not might, but might not be that which they were led to believe, and now are becoming uncomfortable, both physically and, if you will, conceptually and morally, about the role that they've been ordered to play. Well, I think that that the uh, that attitude is is an attitude that's developing amongst the American populace, that they were led to believe one thing, uh, and experience and and recent history now is is showing that we're. Or it's something else, whether it's the uh, the uh, story of uh, saving uh, Private Lynch, or the weapons of mass destruction. Uh, we, we're, we are being told one thing, but reality uh, is is showing us another thing, and that dysfunction there is is going to reap us. Uh, the the problem with the discourse that's now taking place, and of course we should expose the lies. That yeah. We should expose a lie. But all of it, to some extent, is a red herring because nobody is saying that the war on conceptual, spiritual, and moral terms, the use of violence to solve these problems, that still hasn't been attacked and, and if, if you will, uh, discredited. Jerry, I'm sorry we're so out of time. Isn't that, isn't that wonderful how 30 <laughs> seconds, 30 minutes go? I want to thank you all for sharing with us. Uh, if you want more about... Uh, uh, Jerry and Sis Levin, go to the website, uh, ecapc.org, uh, and punch in their names on the search, and you'll get all the information you can about Jerry and Sis Levin. Thank you for being with us, and f be a peacemaker. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs>